to type one to two words that best describe how your calls went to invite others to the Senate action campaign. Let's get started. All right, excellent. And the biggest thing that we just want to say is thank you all for joining us tonight. You've made it the right spot. If you are looking for how to take action on putting a price on carbon in the U.S. House, join us for tonight's CCL leadership call from our three esteemed speakers. We have CCL's executive director, Mark Reynolds, who'll start us off. And then we'll hear from CCL's vice president of government affairs, Danny Richter, followed by CCL's president, Madeline Perra. And if we've done our job well, after the next half hour, you'll have the chance to celebrate with all of us the success of CCL's Senate Action Campaign. We'll dive into understanding the legislative landscape now that we face as an organization with amplifying our asks to both House Democrat and Republican offices. And we'll jump into taking action to help ensure a price on carbon is included in Congress's reconciliation package. And so with that, Mark, the floor is yours. And we are so grateful for everyone joining us tonight. Great. Thank you, Brett. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the second ever Citizens Climate Lobby All Leader Call. Our planet and the scientists who study it are screaming for help. We are answering the call. Uh, three weeks ago, the Senate campaign started where we were asking people to reach out to their U.S. senators. We started with a goal of 10,000 people reaching out to their senators because so many states quickly exceeded their goal. We raised that goal to 14,815. And as of this morning, 20,000 people, 142, had contacted their senators. In the last three weeks alone, there were over 50,000 contacts to US senators by CCLers. That's a big deal. What are we hearing from people? Well, here's one of the notes we got. I just called my senator's office asking about his support for pricing carbon as part of the budget reconciliation. I was told that it was brought up in last Wednesday's meeting because in the last two, two weeks, they have been getting a lot of calls. So just letting you know that your outreach making calls seems to be working and you might want to let people know this. She said there had been no calls and suddenly there are a lot of calls and it is hitting their radar. That was from Vicki, a volunteer in Oregon. Vicki, thank you for forwarding that note. So what's going to happen in the next little bit? In just a couple of minutes, you're going to hear from Dr. Danny Richter about some context of what, what we're doing here and what he's hearing from his DC team of what's happening on the Hill. Then Madeline Perra will go over uh, what we're asking you to do, uh, the actions, and also kind of lay out the whole program. Uh, we should have plenty of time for Q&A, and we should be able to do all that in 40 minutes or less. If you're a group leader, if you could stay on for a couple minutes at the end, I, there's a couple things I want to go over on the action sheet. And at the very end, we'll also have a video from Senator Whitehouse. So, Dr. Richter, let me turn it over to you now. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I want to begin with a moment of celebration because today the Senate passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I think that what, what I want to share with you is, is a text that I got from our former CCL colleague, uh, Jamie DeMarco. This is the note he sent me. Congratulations. CCL has once again shown the haters that the Senate can pass bipartisan climate legislation. I have no doubt that the climate provisions of the infrastructure package would not be there if it were not for CCL's work over so many years. And I hope you take some time to savor the fruits of your labors. So if you'll join me, I'd like to take a moment to savor the fruits of our labors. Ah, while we're on the topic of savoring, I also wanna talk a little bit about the impact of the Senate campaign that we just wrapped up. Uh, this is a great example of when my job is really fun. Uh, so Mark just shared with us a small taste of the kind of fun we have with all of you behind us. Uh, but I want to share another illustration of how I get to talk about what you are doing and just watch as people's minds explode. So in this instance, which has happened repeatedly with many people in other advocacy organizations, I'll just say casually, I just want to give you an update on the campaign we've been having in the Senate to make sure carbon pricing is in the reconciliation package. We got 9,000 contacts over the first few days, or a little bit later, I might've said, we got 15,000 contacts over the first week. We got 38,000 contacts after two weeks. And today I can say, we finished up with over 50,000 contacts to the Senate. And then the pleasure I have is I just watched their eyebrows go up, up, up their foreheads, the knowing professional mask that so many people wear in DC drops in a moment of vulnerability 
and they repeat that final number. Over 50,000? Wow. And then there's this, this kind of deflation. They look just a little bit smaller because they just don't have any tool in their tool chest, anything like that. They glimpse for a moment entire worlds of strategic possibilities for their own work, if only they had people like you behind them. And in that same moment, they resign themselves to the fact that those possibilities will just never be theirs. But after this, they are listening, listening just a little bit more closely to what I'm saying, and they're tracking a little bit better the strategic decisions that we're making. So again, it's fun. So now that the Senate campaign is over, we're pivoting to the House. Why are we pivoting to the House now? Well, with the Senate campaign, we have very clear indications directly from senators and their staff that there's a very real possibility of getting a carbon price in the reconciliation package. We organized ourselves very quickly to put together the tools that you've been using to mobilize yourselves, your family, your friends, your networks, uh, so that just one and a half weeks after we got these very clear indications from the senators, we were able to launch this campaign with the online tools, with the scripts, and with the ability to count your actions all in one place. Our organization and our impact is being noticed, and we've gotten the message that the Senate offices have noticed your calls, and the carbon price is still very much in the reconciliation discussion. And let's take a moment just to review reconciliation. So four weeks ago, Senate Democrats announced a $3.5 trillion infrastructure plan. It bears repeating because it's such a large number. $3.5 trillion infrastructure plan through reconciliation. The plan included a methane fee. It included a carbon border tariff. It did not include a carbon price. And there really wasn't any more detail than this. There was no legislative text. It was just those headlines. Since this announcement, we've seen the introduction of the Fair Transition Act to flesh out what a border carbon tariff might look like. We've gained intelligence that the methane fee might look a lot like the Methane Emissions Reduction Act, which has been introduced in the Senate by Senators Whitehouse, Schatz, and Booker, and in the House by Representatives Deutsch and Christ. We expect to see reconciliation instructions issued later this week and what that means, the reconciliation instructions over the next few weeks, basically until the Senate comes back into session on September 13th, Senate committees are gonna be putting together the plans to meet their instructions. They'll report out those plans in mid-September. And at that point, that's when the actual reconciliation begins. So we start the process this week. There's about a month for senators, Senate committees to figure out what it looks like. And then in mid-September, that's when the finely negotiated process by which leadership takes what's in those reported plans for meeting the reconciliation instructions, and that's when they make them work together. And we expect that process to be very, very messy, and we expect it to take two to three months, perhaps more. This means that with this campaign, we have struck while the iron was hot. While senators and their staff were most open to suggestion, to creativity, and to what their constituents wanted. I do not know if in mid-September the Finance Committee will include a carbon price in their report, but I do know that we could not have made our voices heard at a more opportune time. We struck at the right time with the right message to maximize the probability that a carbon price is a part of the solution. So now we turn to the House. The most difficult negotiations will happen in the Senate, primarily because the House is more leadership driven but that doesn't mean that there aren't still hurdles to be surmounted in the House. Both moderate and progressive Democrats are wobbly on a carbon price. If the Senate reconciliation bill does include a carbon price, our goal with this House campaign, which we're launching today, is to soften the ground, to make sure that when that reconciliation package is received by the House, they have heard a lot of support from their constituents saying, I want this. This blunts the edge of any opposition they may have had to this idea from other constituencies they might care about. This makes it less likely that they make forceful and unhelpful statements in opposition to a carbon price that they later need to walk back when the Senate Finance Committee reports out a plan that includes a carbon price. As I said three weeks ago, those members of Congress, they get a report every week from their staff about what they got the most calls or emails about. For the next three weeks, we want that report to say your constituents want a carbon price and reconciliation for every single House member. 
And for the House campaign, we have the same asks as we did in the Senate campaign. That is for Democrats. I'm calling or writing to urge you to support and advocate for a carbon price and the reconciliation package when it arrives in the House. And for Republicans in the House, I'm calling or writing to urge you to enact a federal carbon price so that U.S. businesses can avoid paying Europe's border tariff and remain internationally competitive. Now, do you need to contact your member if they're a co-sponsor of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act? Yes. The carbon price and reconciliation is quite different from the carbon price through regular order. House offices may assume that we only want to see a carbon price through regular order. And you have to remember that many of them joined only because you asked them to. So they might not have a strong engagement with the issue beyond being responsive to their constituents, being responsive to you. And so for those members flagging that this is again an opportunity to be responsive to their constituents, will be important, even if they're already a co-sponsor on the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And finally, Republicans do still matter, simply because reconciliation may fail. We might not end up with a big, ambitious reconciliation bill that has strong climate provisions. We may then be back to needing Republicans to be on board with the regular order bill. Our chances there in this scenario are going to be greatly improved if they're hearing throughout this highly partisan process that they still have lots of their constituents who want something like this. It will affect how, how they view the entire climate provisions of this process and lead to fertile ground for us. The passage of the infrastructure bill today through the Senate, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, not the, the, the reconciliation bill, through, with 19 Republican votes, including that of Mitch McConnell, gives us renewed hope for bipartisan possibilities in the Senate. But this possibility is only real if reconciliation fails. And if we were to assume that that happens and it doesn't fail, then we missed our shot. So it's still very much worth it to take a swing at reconciliation, and it's still very much worth it to continue engaging with Republicans throughout this process. So that's what I want to say. Madeline, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Danny. Well, I know it's been said already, but I have to say again how extraordinary your response has been on the Senate campaign. Your commitment is reverberating throughout the organization, and I want you to know that I'm proud of the work that was done in every single state in our country by every single uh, set of CCLers in the state. Okay, so the Senate campaign ends today. Of course, it's totally fine for people to keep using the landing page and contacting their senators. And the House campaign is a lot like the Senate one. It will again be three weeks long. It will end August 31st, and we'll use basically the same scripts we used in the Senate. There'll be a landing page again that has the email and call tools embedded right in it. And that URL will be just as easy to remember. It's cclusa.org slash house. So national staff will send one email a week to all supporters starting tomorrow, like we did in the Senate campaign, and we'll text the people who are signed up for text action alerts one time this week. Starting next week, um, we'll, we'll run phone banks to call supporters in Democratic districts with an extra emphasis on those places where we think the Member of Congress is a bit shaky. You know, we started phone banks. It looks like you are loving them. They are helping a lot. We piloted that, uh, learned a lot in the last bit of the Senate campaign, and we're going to roll it again in the House one. Any CCL volunteer anywhere in the country who likes phone banking can help with calling our supporters. They're fun to call. And we know some of you like phone banking from our partnership with EVP and the Senate phone banking that we just did. So you can sign up on CCL Community. So as has been said, our national goal for this campaign is 10,000 people calling and emailing their representatives in the House everywhere in the country. One thing that's different from the Senate campaign is that headquarters is not setting a unique goal for each district because you know better than us what the right target is for your district. So please confer with each other and set your own goal for your member of Congress. You'll be able to see our national progress though on the action tracker right from the start as well as how many people in your chapter and in your district contributed to that national goal, how many contacted your representative. Now, of course, that only works if people use our action tool, 
So keep sending people to cclusa.org slash house. And then of course, use everything you learned in the last three weeks to reach your representatives now. So start again by setting a personal goal for yourself and tell your teammates what it is. You know, when I told all of you on our first all leadership call that I was pledging to get 25 people to take action, that I was so motivated with all of you knowing that, that I wasn't gonna fail. And yes, I did reach my goal. And I've heard from a lot of you that it worked to use phrases like, I have a favor to ask, but you don't have to do it. And would you help me reach my personal goal of 25 people to contact our representative? A lot of chapters called their rosters. Some of you held co-working parties on Zoom to support each other while you did the work. So I encourage you to go back to the people you know who took action in the last three weeks. These are your best prospects because they already know how to do it. And hopefully they experience a little rush of empowerment from taking action. But I will admit that I feel a bit uncomfortable asking more from my friends and I'm gonna go back to them and I'm gonna role play how I'll get myself past that problem. So Mark's gonna to pretend to be my neighbor again, like he did last time. Hey Mark, thanks so much for contacting our senators last week. Not only did I make my pledge of 25 people with your help, but our senators got more than 800 messages from all over Wisconsin. I'm confident that made an impression on them. Was it pretty easy for you to contact them? It was really easy, actually. I'm glad I could help. Well, super. Well, now we need to get the house moving. So I'm hoping I can ask another favor because I made a new pledge to get 25 people to contact Representative Pocan. It's a little hard for me to ask you again because I know you're busy, but this summer and fall is our best shot to get carbon pricing enacted. So you don't have to, but if I give you the new link to call Representative Pocan, would you be willing to help me out again? Of course I would, Madeline. Uh, it will be even easier this time since I know what to do now. And all the wildfires and floods are really scaring me, so I want to keep helping. Oh, thanks so much, Mark. Do you want to do it now, or should I send you the link? Go ahead and send me the link. Okay. And I'll do it. All right. So I'm going to send it right now so that I don't forget. And as soon as I hear back from you that you've done it, I'll add you to my list for the house. And feel free to send that link on to people you know who are also worried about climate change. All right. Thanks for the help, Mark. So everybody, did you notice how I dealt with the discomfort of asking again? A thing I've learned over time from doing lots of uncomfortable things is that I've learned that if I name the thing up front that's uncomfortable for me, it makes it easier for me to keep going with that person, easier for me to do it. And it does seem to also make people wanna help. So that's why I said, it's a little hard for me to ask again. All right, well, three weeks ago, I also talked about having a backup plan of going to my farmer's market with the clipboard. I didn't do that, but the CCLers in Arizona and New Mexico have had great success in doing this. Here's what Bill Barron, our regional coordinator there, told me about their impact. He said, in Flagstaff, we had four one and a half hour clipboarding sessions at an outdoor park and a town park and one one and a half hour session at the farmer's market between Saturday and Tuesday. The day before we began, Arizona had reached 227 out of our 400 goal. By Tuesday, we were at 386 out of 400. So we went from 57% of our goal to 97% of our goal over that period. And then in Albuquerque on August 5th, we had reached 87 uh, contacts or users of our goal to get 100. Over the weekend, we did a three hour clipboarding session and two farmers markets. On Monday, there were 162 people who had made those contacts. So we went from 87% of our goal to 161% of the goal. Most of those times it was myself and a volunteer. So just two to three people. So if you wanna reach really big numbers of new people in this campaign, Consider finding a buddy or two and go someplace outside where climate worried people might be found. The recent IPCC report should make everyone want to help you. And given COVID now, I, I only recommend doing this if you're vaccinated, the cases aren't too bad where you are and you probably should consider wearing a mask. The script and instructions are already on community for how to do this um, using what our Arizona and New Mexico volunteers did. And Brett's put all of our campaign resources uh, 
on the same page on community. So if you can just probably put budget in there, but the name of the page is budget reconciliation actions. And that's right on community. For those of you who are on social media, there's also a social media toolkit on that page. We started updating it for the house campaign and Ashley will be continuing to add to it. You can like and share our posts, of course, and make your own. You can share our TikTok videos. One of the Senate campaign videos uh, by Nick Huey, it got 37,000 views. Uh, that's the one where Nick Huey wants a carbon price for his birthday. And if you wanna learn about TikTok, there's a training on Thursday. I've also heard good stories of people privately messaging through social media. In fact, I think I saw that in the chat before we started, especially uh, messaging to people in their circles who are posting about the climate. So I'm gonna stop here so we can move, move to the Q&A. Please keep sharing what you're doing and learning with each other in our CCL community forums. And I'm gonna let Brett and Mark take it from here. Hey, Brett, do you wanna remind people how they can ask questions? Absolutely, yeah. So we're gonna transition now. We've already got a very robust group of questions for people, uh, but as it displays here on this slide and as it will display as well on the new slide that we're gonna project from right here, uh, you have to go to pollev.com. You can do that from your phone if it's a smartphone or your computer browser if you open up your own internet. And then once you go to pollev.com, type in forward slash CCL123. You can also click on the link that we've been putting in the chat. Uh, we'll put it again here in just a moment and uh, we'll take these in the order of the most popular votes. Great. Okay, well, we'll send this first one to Danny. Uh, Danny, we heard Senator Markey describe some Green New Deal items proposed in the reconciliation bill but he never mentioned carbon pricing as one of them. Uh, any thoughts on this? It's expected. Uh, what we've heard from our conversations with senators is that they want to figure out the what's in the reconciliation bill, quote unquote, in the family first. And so there is not, uh, it is not the case that all senators on the Democratic side, and remember they needed every single one of them for reconciliation, are on board with a carbon price. And so uh, they're not going to talk about something that they're not all on board with until they're all on board with. Uh, so they can get behind the methane fee, they can get behind the border carbon tariff, they're talking about that, uh, but they're not all on board with this. And so that's, that's, why, uh, that's why you're not seeing senators mention it uh, like Senator Markey. And Danny, just as a follow up to that, wouldn't it be strategically more intelligent for them not to bring it out early so that there would be people who would attack it, start attacking it early? Yeah, I think that that's, that's part of the consideration is they don't want it. It's bringing it out prematurely before people are on board and having people attack it, uh, that gives the people who are wobbly less room to maneuver. Uh, and so having working through that and getting everybody on board with something that's workable uh, quietly, uh, not in the in the public view. That's what they're trying to accomplish here. Great. Uh, next one's related to media. Um, and uh, I'm going to give that to you, Madeline, if you don't mind. Given CCL's overwhelming success in lobbying senators, can you comment on CCL's follow-up success with mainstream media, Times, WAPO, Political, MSNBC? Are we succeeding persuading reporters to include carbon pricing when reporting along with Clean Energy Standard, Climate Civilian Corps, et cetera. Yeah, I do wish that our communications director, Flannery, was here to answer that. Uh, but she and, and her team are doing really quite a good job with uh, getting us into more and more national media. You'd like uh, but, to get available if you want me to. Oh, sure, cool. Um, I'll, I'll just say, though, as Danny was just saying, uh, in some regards, uh, some of these, the, some of this is wanting to stay a little quiet. So she's threading a careful needle there. Do you want to say anything, Flannery? If you, if you're sure. Available. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Madeline. Um, so you're absolutely right. We're threading a careful uh, needle here. And so far, right now, my positioning toward the mainstream media is to tell them about all the incredible work that you guys are doing in the field from the grassroots. So right now. The, um, the pitch that I am sending to climate reporters, to political reporters um, at all of these, these media outlets you've mentioned is to talk about the incredible um, results from the Senate campaign, all this contact that you are um, pushing out toward the Senate and now we'll be pushing out toward the House. So that's what we're talking about right now. And then um, as Danny said, uh, 
when we get to a point when um, when carbon pricing hopefully can uh, you know be included as we are asking for it to be, um, then we will push really really hard on that uh, that angle in the media. Great. Why don't you stay with us in case those other media related questions that come along as we're um, going here. Uh, Danny, what climate provisions were in the bill the Senate passed today? Um, there were there were there were quite a few. Uh, I've been on vacation, so I'm not fully up to date on that. Uh, but uh, Mark, you did skip the most popular question. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. And so maybe we could address that. Since carbon pricing uh, is not included in the Senate budget reconciliation instructions to committees, how could it be added at this point by amendment? The instructions have not been issued yet, number one. And number two, all the instructions say is to a committee is you must raise this much revenue or you must spend this much revenue. So the committees get to decide how they do that. So we wouldn't see what the finance committee in this case is going to do until mid-September. Uh, so number one, instructions have not been issued yet. Number two, even when the instructions are issued, they'll be so vague that we won't know if a carbon price is in or out until mid-September. Great, thanks for catching that, appreciate that. Uh, okay, when people ask about the dividend in the context of the budget reconciliation package, what is the answer do you recommend? Danny, I think that's a good one for you also. Yeah, uh, the reason uh, we did not include the dividend in the messaging is because if, if we don't get a carbon price into reconciliation, we don't get a chance to advocate for the dividend. And uh, including the dividend in our messaging now, that complicates the message. And so we wanna have a simple, clear message. We want a carbon price and reconciliation. If we're successful, we'll know in mid-September. If we're successful, then we'll have the opportunity to also advocate for as much as possible of that going to a dividend. But if we advocate for both of those at the same time now, it's less likely that we get either. So we're advocating for the key that unlocks the door. And once we've walked through that door, then we talk about the dividend. That's the plan. Do you think Biden's hand is forced a little bit by his commitment not to raise taxes on anybody under $400,000 that at least a significant portion would have to go to a dividend because of that commitment? We have certainly heard repeatedly from Senate offices that that is a big issue for, uh, for President Biden is that commitment. Uh, and a dividend is not the only way that you can address that. There are other things you can do other than uh, a cashback rebate, although that is that is a very good way of doing that. Uh, so yes, I have heard that that is a realistic concern for uh, the Biden administration. And uh, just bear in mind, there's more than one way of uh, addressing that for the Biden administration, not just the dividend. Okay. Madeline, is there a way they can find out who among their contacts actually made a call or email or at least their senators or district or chapter? I am happy to say yes. Um, that question has been asked and I have gone to IT and tomorrow they will send a report uh, to the RCs and SCs that lists everybody who uh, responded using our tool, both supporters and people who are not supporters and opted out of becoming one. That list will have their name and city uh, and whether they are or aren't a supporter. It won't have their contact information because uh, we promised the, um, the non-supporters that we would not keep contacting them. Uh, but you will have all the names and can go to your SC to, to see who of your people are on it. Nice. That's great. Uh, Danny, I'll give you this one. What do you suggest we say to other environmental groups and people who say that we shouldn't ask for anything too big uh, that will disrupt or risk making the already precarious reconciliation package to fail? Have you seen the headlines? <laughs> I mean, uh, shouldn't ask for something too big. I thought you were a climate advocate. What the heck? I mean, this is the moment. All right. We should have addressed this 30 years ago. We need to go as big as we possibly can. It is up to the Democrats who are elected to make the reconciliation package work. Uh, it is our job to make sure that what is in there is as strong as possible for our issue for the climate. So uh, I so I would say is I thought you were a climate advocate. <laughs> That's, okay. I answer that. Okay, let me see what's next. 
Uh, Madeline, here's something about the action tracker that just disappeared. Sorry. Can we find out who among our contacts actually made the, no, the, Madeline already answered that one, right? Okay. All right. Oh, I see what it said. Our house MLC has said that HR 2307 is a bridge too far. His weekly newsletter is full of vituperation and vicious antagonism toward every feature of the Biden agenda. Advice about approaching him on the issue of carbon pricing. Uh, Madeline, okay. do you want to take that? Go, then we'll get both of you. Do you go ahead first, Madeline, and then we'll Danny. <laughs> Persist, persist, persist. Find out what that member cares about and how to link it. Um, and bring in the right messengers. I'm going to guess you might need to bring uh, some conservatives to that member of Congress. Danny, what do you want to say? Yeah, uh, I was guessing this was a Republican. Uh, and we've been having a lot of success with our, our message about American competitiveness abroad, the EU CBAM, the coming Canadian CBAM and uh, talking about the, the international international scene. So I think that that message is really working with Republicans. In fact, there were 19 Republicans who wrote a letter to President Biden asking to that he asked the EU to not do the, the CBAM uh, so recently. So I think that the CBAM carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, so I think that the border message is a way to, to to crack through uh, some obstacles and get Republicans in Congress today uh, to look at this issue in a new way. Oh, this is a good one. Madeline, why don't you take this? Contacting the House now seems premature. Why not wait until we know what is in reconciliation, Bill, and then contact the House with a more pointed message? Well, I'm just going to say what Danny tells me. <laughs> 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 uh, which is this, this is the time that they are discussing and talking to each other about what to be doing and, and what they can handle and what's the strongest thing they can put in there. Uh, and it, it's not too early and we'll keep it going for a while as needed. And now let's see how Danny can make that better. It's about softening the grounds. Uh, we'll know in mid-September uh, what is in or out of the Senate reconciliation package and House members might just say some unhelpful things about a carbon price. And so they're less likely to say those unhelpful things and box themselves into a corner if the number one issue every week from their calls and emails from their constituents has been, we want a carbon price and reconciliation. After they get that for three weeks, they're much less likely to say something unhelpful. So I would push back. I think this is the perfect time to be reaching out to them. Uh, but that does not exclude the possibility that there may be another time to contact them again. Yeah, and this is also our DNA. We are the organization that makes things happen. We don't wait for people's permission. We don't wait till it's the right time. We're the organization that says, this is what needs to happen. We're going to go make it happen. Uh, let's see. What happens if people call after the deadline? Will the link still work? Will it keep adding to the totals? Madeline, can you take that? Uh, yes, the landing page will still work and the link will still work and it will be there at least through the end of the month or, or until the message is clearly out of date. Uh, and I will check and confirm with IT, but I expect that you'll be able to see the Senate numbers still after today and we'll be adding uh, the House uh, uh, numbers for your view. Great. Uh, how much would how much would the clean electricity payment program reduce carbon emissions? Okay, Danny. Yeah, this is so why this you're is our, what our big science guy. Well, this, is the, I, this question is asking what the clean electricity standard has become. There is no standard, it's just payments. And so if you are a producer of energy, meaning you're polluting, you, you are burning fossil fuels, but if you pollute less than the average, you can get paid for being for not polluting. Uh, and that's, that's what the clean electricity standard has become. Uh, so of course, our approach is to make polluters pay. This, the approach that they're in now is, is paying the cleanest polluters instead. Uh, and when we look at that, I mean, we haven't, we haven't seen the details. We don't, we don't know. But uh, when you look at what has been discussed with a clean electricity standard, uh, it would help, uh, but it would not help nearly as much as, as a carbon price, uh, like we're talking about. Um, so if you, I think Rick Knight looked at one example uh, of a clean electricity standard uh, and compared it to the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, 
uh, and uh, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act in that example would achieve the clean electricity standard 2030 targets by 2024. Um, so clean electricity standard would help now clean electricity payment program, uh, but it's still just in the, um, it's all carrot, it's no stick. Uh, that's had to be done to make it compatible with reconciliation. It would help reduce emissions, uh, but still not nearly as much as doing an economy wide 80 percent of emissions carbon price as we've been talking about for years. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you for submitting all these questions. Uh, thank you for all you are all doing. As I said at the start of the call, if you're a group leader, we'd like you to stay on for just a minute so we can talk about the action sheet for just a second. Everybody's welcome to stay on and then we'll close tonight's call with a video from Senator Whitehouse. So our speaker this month is Pamela Benson Owens. There's a lot of things that she could work with us on. She has a lot of areas of expertise, but the areas she's gonna be focusing on this Saturday is constructive listening. So it's this thing we have where we kind of have a nice balance between soft skills, hard skill speakers. This month is constructive li uh, listening. Next month is the carbon border adjustment. So we're looking forward to having her. Uh, many of us have heard her speak already and she's phenomenal. Uh, the one action that isn't included in the uh, what Madeline described, but is part of the action sheet, is to ask endorsers and community leaders to contact their members of Congress also. So if you have endorsements that your chapter have generated, if you have community leaders that have spoken up already on carbon pricing or the Energy Innovation Act, please ask them to reach out to their members just as we have been doing. And then the last thing we'll do is leave you with uh, Senator Whitehouse's words. Thank you all again so much for being with us tonight. Hi, I'm Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, and I want to start by saying thank you to Citizens Climate Lobby for the wonderful, really astonishing work uh, that you've done to help us solve our climate crisis. Here in Washington, we are close to putting together the most comprehensive piece of climate legislation Congress has ever seen. We're going to have to do it in the Senate through the reconciliation prog process, which means we'll have to get all 50 Democrats on board and perhaps get the vote of Vice President Kamala Harris to put us over the top. But we have a real great chance to do it. Uh, President Biden began with a wonderful program and we've added to it since then the methane fee, which instantly became the third most impactful climate intervention in the array of climate interventions that the Biden administration is supporting. And we're working to refine and define the border adjustment so that carbon pricing uh, doesn't set one country against another unfairly and we can protect American manufacturing and interests. And at the end of the day, my goal is to make sure that our combined plan includes a real price on carbon that will really drive down carbon emissions and set a standard for America to lead the world when we hit Glasgow in November. None of this would be possible without the energy of Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm really proud of the work that you've done, and I thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.